there, world, wherever you are, welcome once again to the There Will Be Geek podcast, pouring geek information into the blender, giving it a good old swizz, chucking in a straw and feeding it straight through your brain intravenously. My name is Mike, and on my right we have... Shani. And on my left we have... Kev. And we are here to entertain, to divert, and generally otherwise make your lives that little bit brighter for today. As always, we're starting with our regular Thimble of Win section. So, Cav, for this podcast, what is your Thimble of Win? Okay, so for uh, this time round, straight from the you bloody well took your time, didn't you, files, I recently started getting into World of Warcraft. Wow. Um, <laughs> I see what you did there. I didn't actually do that. <laughs> <laughs> now you did. We're actually that, finding this. Do you know what you've just done? Oh. This is actually quite funny as Mike was just taking a sip of a nice hot cup of tea. <laughs> anyway, Which do... the desk is now wearing. Yeah, okay, do continue, Kev. Um yeah, I I played other MMOs. I'm I'm generally principally a solo player. It's it's mainly how I've always played games and I've always sort of gone into MMOs a bit cautiously. I've, I've played a lot of ones that were meant to be good for solo play, usually gotten bored after a few weeks. And with the movie coming out recently, um, I decided to give it a shot and found myself really enjoying it. So I'm playing a, a dwarf warlock named Maguin <laughs> and I'm really enjoying it. I mean, so far, look, it's early days. I, I may wind up getting bored, but I'm finding it a much better experience because I think just the world they've created and the way they've designed the environments, there's something Blizzard do in the polish that just makes it much more engaging. A lot of MMOs take place in very sort of um, generic environments. Unless you're really, really into the systems, the actual running around gets very dull after a while. Not so here. Um, it feels like a real place. You know, it feels like the various areas are connected to each other. And it's just fun to explore. And it's buying a very pleasant surprise. I can't speak to this from being a player myself, but my better half, um, Kerry, is an avid player of WoW, to the extent whereby she's upgrading her old computer as we speak, because recent patches have meant that her old Mac is just not able to be able to do what is required from the new patches on the game. And... I look at what she's the backgrounds when she's playing, and it is stupendously well put together. I mean, it's a really, really, really pretty system, and clearly a lot of effort is put into this. So, yeah, go for it. That sounds like a great idea. It is. It has a great story as well, because I also have been playing WoW for a few years now. Um, but I need to ask you the most important question, Kev. Are you Alliance or Horde? Alliance Get for out. Now. Get out. Get out. Get <laughs> out. Dirty lies, bastard. I'm going to roll a Horde character, though. I'm going to do both. Oh. Yeah, because that's, that's, a, that's just how I roll. It's all right. I understand. I started off as Alliance, too, but then I quickly gave that up and went for the Horde. Okay. So, Shani, other than the Horde, <laughs> what is your Thimble of Win for this week? My Thimble of Win this week is FNAF. If you do not know what I have just said, it is F-N-A-F. That stands for Five Nights at Freddy's. Um, there is a bunch of these games out there. There's Five Nights at Freddy's. There's Five Nights at Freddy's 2, 3, 4. There's Five Nights at Freddy's World. There's even an ebook, um, Five Nights at Freddy's The Silver Eyes, which I just finished reading and I loved it. But right now, if you go to scottgames.com, you will see a image. It has been changing recently, but this is leaking and teasing to the next game, Sister Location. What you can also do is if you view the source, um, what is it called? Source? Source code? Yeah, source code for the site. You can actually find out weird information as well, which also relates back to, like Scott has done this before, which is gave it, um, you know, the bite. Um, controversy dates but this one if you break it down you can actually make out a timetable and the timetable lists like Monday Tuesday Wednesday Friday all the different kinds of um, animatronics which would probably be in this game and which weren't it also alludes to something called Afton Robotics and the Crimson I think it may be Crimson Institute there is a lot of information just in 
this one website, even though it has just one image on it. Also, the trailer for it as well, where you see it looks like it could be like a storage facility or a robotics um, manufacturer or something about maybe this is where those animatronics come from or the story behind them. There's the actual trailer where you hear the words, don't hold us against us and you don't know what we've been through. It's just blowing my mind reading all the different kinds of theories that people are having out there about these games and what this new game is going to be about. Is it a sister location as in like business wise? You know how you've got Coca-Cola and Schweppes and all those things being sister companies. Or is it something family related? So one of the victims... Um, sister is doing something and it's oh it's just blowing my mind like there are so many things out there at the moment on forums in YouTube um, people are doing all kinds of crazy fan art and I just I can't wait for this to come out so I can find out more story and more background and I love things that I can investigate and this is why I'm achievement whore on games like I have to find <laughs> out all the backstory and I just can't wait and there isn't an official release date for Sister Location, but from what I can gather on the web, it is coming out this fall, and obviously this is American, so for us that would be our spring. So yeah. not too far away, which is still a long time considering with Scott Games. Like Five Nights at Freddy's came out in August 2014. The next one came out in November 14. The next one, March 2015. Next was 2015. One after that was um nap world which we'll kind of skip over that was at the beginning of this year so in the relative timeline of games this one has been quite a long wait and i'm done waiting <laughs> okay well that does sound intriguing mm-hmm. uh, please let us know more about it when it does eventually be released Ooh, yeah. for me the film of win this week has been the recent announcement uh, a couple of weeks ago <sighs> black mirror Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Black Mirror, Black Mirror is a very dark, twisted, slightly sci-fi kind of skewed view of the world brought to us originally on Channel 4 by Charlie Brooker. Uh, Charlie Brooker is a columnist and reviewer who has been kind of regularly on British screens for a while. He's a well-known satirist. He's done his own... done programs about how TV ruined your life. He's presented News Wipe and Games Wipe on BBC Three and reviews of the year and so on and so forth. And he's really good, kind of a very good acerbic satirical journalism. This has always been his kind of dark sci-fi visions. I mean, the, the note what the notable standout from a recent series of Black Mirror on Channel Four was a potential future situation where the British Prime Minister has his daughter kidnapped and Part of the ransom is that he has to fuck a pig live on TV. This, by the way, was way before any of the recent revelations, allegedly, about former British Prime Minister David Cameron came to the surface. So it was kind of weirdly prescient. But there's some really dark stuff in there. Anyway, Netflix have got hold of this now. So Netflix and Charlie Brooker are producing a third series, which is going to think, I think there's going to be like six or seven episodes. Previous series have run to like three episodes because it's been something where Channel 4 have put a lot of resources towards it to make it look and feel really good. But as a result, which has to further kind of the full hour, you have to be a little bit more budget shy. Whereas Netflix have been able to take it to the next level with regards to that. And I'm really Mm. intrigued in that. This could be very dark and very twisted, but very, very interesting to watch. So that's coming out on October the 21st this year. Mm, Halloween. Okay, moving on rapidly to the main subject for our discussion this time. And for today, we are delving deep into the world that is Magic the Gathering. So guys... What's all this about? I'm taking the reins, baby. Oh, really? Yes, I am. So Magic the Gathering is one hobby that is probably the longest running hobby that I've had in my life other than video games. So I've been playing Magic the Gathering um, for over 10 years now. Okay, so could you tell us a little bit about what is Magic the Gathering? Um, Where does it come from? What are its roots? What's going on with it now? What's been, what's basically, what's been the history and the future of this pastime? For those who don't know, Magic the Gathering is a card game. Um, You can play two or more players. Obviously, you can't play by yourself. Well, you can, but we don't really want to hear about that right now. (laughs) 
So, Magic the Gathering started out in 1993. So, this is when it was first published by Wizards of the Coast, which is a huge company these days. There's over 20 million players of Magic the Gathering in the world right now. So, pretty much you probably know someone who does play or has played Magic in their life, particularly in high school. That's where I found a lot of people started playing it. But it was great. There's also an online version of the game too, which came out in 2002, but it got updated in like 2008. The deal with Magic the Gathering is it's a card game. You'd start off with a 60 card deck. You can have bigger decks, smaller decks, whatever you like. Personally, this girl loves a big deck. But... <laughs> Always in the gutter, Shani. Always in the gutter. I can't Do help you it. Deck gently. <laughs> <laughs> I always make sure that um that my deck has protection as well. I use <laughs> the GoPro sleeves and very good. Got to laminate it. Oh yeah. <laughs> but take care of your deck out there. <laughs> so what it is is you have as a player you have twenty life. The person that you're playing against has twenty life, and the, the aim of the game is to essentially kill them, get them down to zero life. And the way that you do this is by um, creatures and spells and incantations, all different kinds of cards. So there are five elements as well in this. So there's black, red, green, white, and blue. Each color has its own kind of strength. So with black cards, you're looking at things that have a lot of death touch and things that can kill instantly or do um poisons and things like that red is your pretty much a punch in the face you've got a lot of instant cards that'll take down your life like hit you for five or spread damage it's a very quick moving color now with regards to this i mean for the moment you've given you're giving some very good examples of mm -hmm. what goes on with regards to this game now when it comes down to things like this the concept of trading card games specifically, mm -hmm. specifically myself and Cav having been brought up in the UK through the 80s yeah. we would naturally I think the first place we would go to for this would be a game called Top Trumps now that mm -hmm. had some similarities to the kind of baseball trading card games that were developed in the US throughout the first part of the 20th century it was a very simple card game but I think the the hook was that they they put, they, they made decks based on different properties yeah so TV shows, comic book characters, that kind of thing. Cars, military equipment, Cars, yeah, that, trains, that sort planes, of thing. that kind of thing. So there was millions, and there was this collectible kind of aspect to it. And the whole principle with that was it was a case of if you have more than one person, they, you've, you've shuffled out the deck, you read out a particular stat from your card, and if it's the biggest stat of all the three, you win the cards. And that would be this. So is, is magic based on the same sort of kind of numbers? Is it just a case of my card is bigger and stronger than yours therefore my card will win is that how it works well no not particularly because it also has a lot to do with luck um you could have some awesome killer creatures in your deck but you can only have seven cards in your hand at any time if you don't pull those up it's not going to work like the way that it works is you know you pick up a card you can put down land which is like your mana you have to use those to actually sorry, play cards that term mana what does yeah. that mean um mana is like you're counting so on say a creature card or any kind of usable card it'll have a casting cost on it so it'll have like a little circle with like a five on it okay um that i mean you just need five mana of any color yeah um that you tap or use or indicate that you're actually using. And then it may have a little blue symbol next to it, which means you need one blue mana at the same time. So you'd have to use six cards to cast that one card. Then if it's a creature card down the bottom, it would have its a attack and defense. So it may be three slash two, which means when it attacks, it's going to hit for three. But when you attack me and I say I block it, it could only block two damage. Right. If it takes more than two damage, it's going to die. So it's very strategic in that sometimes you can attack with all the creatures that you have. So I'd be going, yep, I'm going to hit you for three, six, nine. But then I would leave myself open and not have anything to defend against with you. So you could have to at least leave one creature out if you want. Um, there's also things that can counteract the things that you do as well. 
it isn't just uh, who's got the bigger creatures or the most life. I've seen games where the person's down to two life and they've got game mechanics that work well together that will obliterate the other person. So I guess a lot of it sounds like it's about managing resources. Yes, sort definitely. Sort of, you know, judging your attacks based on what you've got to defend and mm-hmm. what resources you've got at any one time. Yes, that is definitely correct. And also, presumably, if you've got, say, for example, a one-on-one, you're going to obviously have a much more for- straightforward battle. But mm-hmm. say you've got a group of four people who are all fighting to be who's winning, yep. you, you might find that there might would be, for example, two players might realise that their common interest would be in beating up the bigger, stronger person mm. over there and taking their resources, and therefore they might unofficially gang up on that other person. That is definitely true. I found some larger games like that, but usually when we play, you can only attack the person directly to your left or your right, so okay. you can't jump across the table at ah, someone. See, this but is good. everyone plays in their own different kinds of ways. There's also things called two-headed giants, where you will have two people against another two people, and they will work together to take the other ones out. Yeah. But with that, you know, you can't share like manas or do certain things. You can show each other cards, but, you know, you're still like an independent player. It is very interesting. Um, There are a lot of mechanics in the games that you can work together with, like certain cards. Um, Most recently, I went to a pre-release for um, the Eldritch Moon where it has these cards where after you fulfill a certain condition, like you've taking damage or you've done damage or you've done something else the cards will actually flip over and when you flip the card over you'll see that the two cards when you sit them side by side actually have the image of one larger card and it will have some awesome ability for it magic has a whole different ton of things that do these small little things that will hit you for God knows how much, or stop you from doing something that you desperately need. Yeah, I was at that um, launch that you were at recently. I think we both attended this briefly. I had to leave slightly earlier than you. But one of the things I really noted about this was how busy it was there. I mean, this was taking place at Games Laboratory down in Melbourne. And there was a packed house of people for this launch. So this is a really popular pastime. Oh. I how does it relate to how does it relate to other systems and so on and so forth? I mean, is it do you tend to find that an awful lot of the same people who play this will be, say, for example, role players or gamers or what have you? Or? Yeah, I found that a lot of the people that I've spoken to at these pre releases are into other card games such as Pokemon or Yu Gi Oh, which I I haven't actually played these. I've seen some people play them, but I'm like, I already have one card addiction. I don't need any more as much as I love Pokemon. I, I, believe there, I believe there was also, I mean, for a while, there was things like you know, Vampire, The Eternal Struggle. There have been two or three yeah. other attempts at this, and there are some that have lasted a bit more so than others. Oh, definitely. Um, once Magic became quite popular, other publishers tried to start doing, like, you know, getting in on it. Like, Companion Games brought out um, Galactic Empires, which actually was, like, the first science fiction trading card game. And the cool thing about them was that They allowed players to pay and design their own sort of promo cards at the same time, which was kind of cool. Um, TSR created like their Spellfire game. And as you just mentioned before, Jihad, um, which is now known as Vampire the Eternal Struggle, was another Wizards game, which was out there and it was about modern day vampires. Was there any relation to the White Wolf system of Vampire the Masquerade or the the White Wolf World world of Darkness? I think it was. Yeah. Like... I can imagine that it sounds like, if nothing else, the colon makes me think it's going to be somehow related. And that would yeah, suggest, no, yeah. it was from the research I, I was doing. It they, they did mention it was a vampire card game, uh, the White Wolf one. Yeah, so exactly. I think this is this might be the one. Yeah. Well, Magic the Gathering did take a lot from those kinds of like D and D and um, role playing games, and um, as such as like the creatures and the storylines that you can get from them, but thing with magic is like these pre-releases the one that we've been talking about that i recently went to and mike was like there's so many people there this was actually one of the smaller ones that i've been to yeah. like i've been to ones where i usually um pre-register for these so you know i know that i can play on the day and but i've been to ones where i've seen the line out the door and they're turning people away because they just don't have the seats for it now these pre-releases happen four times a year 
There are many different expansions which will bring out new mechanics, um, new cards. It'll usually have a theme as well, which is really cool. And also corsets as well, which I don't think they're doing anymore. So back in the day with the expansions, there never was a kind of organization to it. They didn't have a schedule for the yeah. expansions or the corsets. They just kind of brought them out haphazardly. Uh, the very first expansion came out in 1993 in December, and that was Arabian Nights, which was cool. Since going in on from there, they were all very irregular and it wasn't till the Mirage expansion set in 1996 is when they started getting regular with it and having three expansions and one core set. So the core set is pretty much just a revision of the base game cards that are out there. Pretty sure they stopped doing the core sets in 2015, so only just last year. Yeah. Core sets are all right. Like they... They weren't as great as the expansions, but they were good to get fillers for, you know, just basic cards that you can just make decks with. I like to make a lot of theme decks as well. Um, so there's a deck where I just have creatures that are angels. So that's a lot of white and white is more your healing kind of stuff. So you get life gain and flying creatures are great because you can only stop a flying creature if you have a flying creature or one that has reach and not every deck is going to do that yeah and the thing is flying cards can block normal creature cards as well so it's fantastic so you could just be hitting someone for like two hits <laughs> every round nothing they can do about it yeah until they get rid of that creature which is kind of cool other things is with the rules of magic it pretty much stays the same like yep. there hasn't been um, they don't change it a lot. There's been three major changes to okay. the rules of Magic, which happened in, like, 94, 99, and 2009. And okay. this is a game that's been going on for, like, how long now? Well, it's, if it was... When did you say it started? Uh, 93. 99 period. So that's 23 years this has been yeah. going. Yeah, and then mm. three major rule changes. And this is the thing. I mean, just somebody who has always been in and around kind of the geekiverse as it is mm. to an extent, Magic has never really been my particular flavour, but at the same time, I've known a lot of people who are really, really heavily into it, particularly friends who are LARPers and role players. And it's interesting to look at Magic as a property and as an object because, A, it kind of reinvented the kind of the trading card things from the middle of the 20th century anyway, but also it's something whereby, as a result, there have been other things that it has gone on to inspire further down the line. Um, we were talking about some of these examples earlier on, weren't we, Cab? What was it you managed to come up with? Um, well, there's been a bit of a resurgence in um, card games and video games. For example, um, there's things like Hearthstone has become very popular. Mm -hmm. Things like Gwent in Witcher 3, which is spinning off into its own game. Could you explain to me what Hearthstone is for a moment? So it's made by Blizzard, the same people who do World of Warcraft. Okay. So it's it's very much a similar format, I guess, to Magic. Yeah. Um, you're sort of doing battle with other players using these decks of cards. I presume you were able to do this online as well, which yeah. kind of means that you don't necessarily, you can be playing against people who, I mean, sure, it's perfectly possible to have matches against people with magic when you're Skyping, but you kind of really need them to be there. So this yeah. allows you to, gives you an environment where you can do that. Yeah, and um, I mean, it's it very much so, it does seem to be inspired by the success of things like magic. Also, you can look at, for example, the success in recent years of games such as Cards Against Humanity. Now, that has been something that's really kind of taken the world by storm. That, and to an extent, a lesser extent, the kind of the oatmeal's exploding kittens. But this is the it. thing. I mean, none of these things would be out there were it not for the wonder that is magic. I mean, again, it's never been my particular flavour, but it's just been something that's been a big part of so many people's growing up. I mean, I know people who have an entire massive kind of flip albums of the damn things. Oh, jeez. Mm. Skip the flip albums. I've got boxes of thousands of these cards. Like you get very addicted to collecting them like sometimes like people call it like a, um, a card collecting game yeah. and i don't see it as that like i don't purposely go out and buy certain cards because i'm like oh they're gonna go in this set it's just a game that i play and like you know i pick up the good cards when i want because there are different kinds of cards like you've got your you know your commons your rares your ultra rares your legendary yeah. cards like some of these cards now will go for thousands of dollars. Yeah. Like I've gone to tournaments, which let me quickly explain what a tournament is because I keep talking about pre-release tournaments. Yeah. Um, what it is is you turn up on the day to play an expansion pack before it actually comes out. You pay, you know, $40 
whatever you get. Six boosters, which has 15 cards in it each. So this would be almost like, in many ways, like a midnight release of a movie or something. Yeah. Like it's a special promotional event. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Um, most places, like games like that I agree to, they have like a midnight run and a 10 a.m. run and like an afternoon run. And it'll go all weekend. It's crazy. So you get there, you get six boosters, and out of those six boosters, you get to make a 40-card minimum deck. You get given 40 minutes to make it. So generally, you'd make a deck of like 23 creature playing cards, um, you know, spells, whatever, and 17 lands. Make your 40-card deck. But I get a little bit overactive and sometimes make larger ones, which isn't that great. Well, you did say you like a big deck. Yes. And then during the day, you play four rounds. So you play first game against someone. It's best two out of three. If you win, you get two more boosters, which you can't add into the already made deck. What's a booster? A booster is a packet of cards. It's like your normal packet of cards that you get from normal baseball cards and stuff. It would have 15 cards in it. Okay, so it would be like a a small foil pack of cards. Yeah, definitely. And in that, you'd get like a variety of red cards, black cards, green cards, blue cards, you know, artifact cards, whatever, which is kind of cool. That's what I like about the pre-releases is that everyone's on the same level. Yes. Like, no one has a pre-made card. Like, you yeah. can read up on what's going to be in the pre-release, but you have no idea. And so sometimes you get awesome cards and you'll wipe before with everyone, but then sometimes you just don't get anything that works well together. And it's like, oh. And so it's more of a leveler where it entirely really depends on the skill and ability of the person to be able to play the game with the resources they have. Yeah, partly yes. Um, but sometimes you do just get absolutely shit cards that do not work together <laughs> that's at all. Go- you know what? Like, well, that, but that's going to happen in pretty much any oh, system yeah. like it's this. It's very luck based as I mean, well i can't necessarily speak to anything to do with this but i particularly remember panini sticker albums for football players in the 80s and the amount of times i would get the, the same the same kind of i would end up with five pictures of wayne faraday for no bloody good reason or what <laughs> have you it'd just be a case of what the hell have i even got he's terrible why does st- but yeah yeah and also with the decks as well because you need the mana so you can actually cast all your spells and creatures sometimes you'll get mana screwed and what happens there is you have, like, the correct amount of mana in your deck. It's all balanced out fantastically. You've shuffled it properly. It's They've cut it. It's brilliant. But you just don't get any. Like, you'll start off with seven cards. Usually you want about three of them with some mana in it. So you can play some first cards. But then you won't get any more mana. So you'll, from the, from the basically the main pile of cards that you're drawing yeah. from every time, yeah. you'll be like, come on, where's my mana, where's my yep. mana? And you'll get all the other, and it'll be something, you'll be kind of building all of these things, but running out of gas. Mm-hmm. And you can only ever hold seven cards in uh, your hand, so you have to start chucking some shit out. And you'll know that the moment you start chucking the good stuff away, that'll be when all the mana will turn Yeah. Out. It just gets so frustrating because the person will, they'll be fine, and then they'll start hitting you and killing you, and it's not a good game. It's not. It's more fun when you can actually have a good battle against someone and get down to the wire and, yeah. you know, all these mechanics are going off and it makes it so much more interesting. This is why, as well as these previous tournaments are fun to watch, there's actually, in 1986, they started the Pro Tour for Magic the Gathering. Oh, cool. And people were like, oh, cool, they're just playing a little card game. It's like, well, that first card game, the winner walked away with $40,000. Wow. <laughs> okay, now that's quite impressive. Yep. You get some great stories from Magic. There was, I think it was at one of these pre-release tournament, um, not pre-release, but one of the pro tours. It came down to the last game. And this gentleman had in his hand a card that says, sometimes you get weird rules where you have to drop the card Mm -hmm. and any other card that it touches, it will destroy. It's a weird card. Like you've got to physically drop the card and whichever card it takes gets rid of. And so this gentleman, he called the judge over and did a little check with it. And the guy was like, okay. What this gentleman did was he started tearing up his card and ripped it into tiny little pieces of confetti and just dropped it on the table, wiped the board clean. (laughs) Oh, wow. Yeah. See, that's thinking, that's, that's thinking outside of the box. Mm-hmm. That is that is incredibly clever. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's really good. So you get some really funny moments in Magic sometimes because the cards will have instructions on them how to use them, and sometimes 
you can just bend the rules a little bit more and get your way. Okay, well, trying to draw this to a bit of a close for the podcast now, where are we going with regards to the future of Magic? Are there any good releases coming up later on this year? Do we know of? Well, there will be. Um, there's already been two pre-releases, so we've got two more for the end of the year. I'm not sure what they are. I usually find out a little bit closer to them what they are, what's going to be in them, which is cool. But I think about two years ago, they were in talks about making a Magic the Gathering movie with oh. Hasbro. And mm. um, Given that everything else seems to have its kind of universe movie, I mean, we've got the G.I. Joe movie. There was a mm. Battleships movie, for goodness yeah. sakes. Mm. So I, if it's done well, I can see that being a good idea, but I, I remain intensely dubious oh, about yeah. this. Well, I haven't heard anything else about it since then, so I don't know. It is pretty cool. I just do want to say one thing, though, because I was interested in magic for a very long time and when i was in high school the guys wouldn't teach it to me because they didn't think i'd understand or like it that much they don't play anymore and i still am which is cool but my friend alistair actually got me into magic and he actually has his own online store which i'll give a little plug now because alistair is a player himself who he had a very large collection of cards very large i think large is an understatement here but he wasn't using part of these and he wanted to you know offer other players an easy way to get a hold or cards and finding cards so he set up his own online shop called alistair's magic emporium we'll leave a link down in our little descriptions for it and so he just sells individual cards going from rares um commons and they're also really affordable too, like compared to other places that you'll find on like eBay or whatever. Very decently priced. And he sends them out really quickly too. Oh, cool. Which is kind of cool. And he will even help you find cards too. So if you're after a particular yeah. card and he doesn't have it, he'll be able to help you out with it because he can't obviously have everything. There's thousands of cards. But yeah. if you're in Australia, I'm not sure if he actually ships overseas or not. You can check it out on the website. But... Alistair's Magic Emporium. Check it out. Okay, so let's say you're almost completely ignorant of this thing. Yep. You have absolutely no knowledge. In other words, you mean. <laughs> <laughs> How would you, what, what advice would you give someone who wants to get into magic? Because obviously there's a lot of stuff out there. You can go on the internet. You can find just days worth of stuff. Oh, yeah. That's probably a huge jumble of information. What, mm -hmm. what would you recommend the best way to actually start as a beginner magic player? As a beginner, I'd say check out the Wizards of the Coast website because they actually do have a few pages there that explain the mechanics of the games, how to play, all of that kind of stuff. But We can post a link to that again yes, with this. Yes, we can post some links down on the bottom. Mm. Another good thing is I would check out with your local card shops because a lot of those places, like um, Games Lab for one, they'll have a, you know, a Friday night's play where people will come in and play with their own decks or they'll have... Yeah. Special nights where beginners can come in and, you know, learn the learn how to play the game because it is very overwhelming at first when because there's all different kinds of things that you can do and build and whatever. I'd say, yeah, check out the Wizards website, see if it is something that you really want to do. Also, there are some great tutorials and um, videos on people playing Magic the Gathering on YouTube as well so you can actually see a game. Um, mind you, some games are very fast and will only go for 5-10 minutes. You've got other games that will be ginormous and will run for like an hour or more. It just really depends. But yeah, check out the Wizard website um, and speak to your local game shops as well because more than likely those people, they want to help you out. They want to get more people into playing these kinds of games. As I said, we will be posting links on the notes for this, both to Alistair's Magic Emporium to Wizards of the Coast, and we will probably be posting up a link to a few of the websites for various different game shops in and around our own area mm -hmm. of Melbourne. If there are any further ones that you guys think are interesting and unusual, please feel free to link up to them on the Facebook group for the There Will Be Geek podcast. And we're always happy about you being able to spruik somewhere local for your local geeks to be able to enjoy themselves. <laughs> okay, I think that pretty much wraps us up for this podcast. Um, yeah, where can we find you? You can find me in pages of Metro Magazine. 
Shani, where can we find you? As always, you can find me on YouTube playing all the games, or you can see my daily tweets to Nintendo bitching about how I still can't play Pokemon Go on my Windows phone. And for me, as with all of us, you can find us in the There Will Be Geek podcast group on Facebook. There's only one thing to add at this point. We're finished! <laughs>